Um, we're going to talk about how to create your own refactoring tool with Clang. And uh, that was just, this was just kind of a placeholder for all the things I wanted to talk about. Here's the, here's the real problem. There's a, uh, a, just a dearth of refactoring tools for C and C++. Um, the existing tools are also tightly coupled to specific IDEs. Uh, Visual SysDex is a good example. It's, it's got some nice functionality in it, but if you're using Eclipse, can't use it. If you're using Vim, you can't use it. So the tightly coupled to an IDE problem is, um, is, is a significant one. Uh, C and C++ code bases are often old. Um, and I don't know why. Something about the culture of C++ with a focus on code that is very concrete and you know, intimately connected with you know, bit twiddling, if you will. There's something in that culture that um, uh, tends to generate code that is like long methods full of lots of details and multiple responsibilities jammed into the same class and things like that. It's, the code's in desperate need of refactoring, but it's so dangerous to do manually that people are afraid to refactor their code, especially if they don't have any automated tests to let them know that they've, they've messed things up. And I, I sympathize with that. So I think the answer is automated, high-quality tools that you can trust. And that trust is really important. Um, how many people here have some kind of environment where it wants to guess ahead of what you're typing and like automatically suggest things and automatically fill things in? How many of you turn that off? Why do I turn it off? Because it's not helping me if I'm typing correct code and you automatically complete it to incorrect code. Nothing should ever take correct code that I'm typing and change it to incorrect code. And it's the same for a refactoring tool. A refactoring tool, when applied to your code, should never ever require a manual edit after you're done applying the tool. It should never take correct code and turn it into incorrect code. But the existing tools that are out there, because they haven't been based on a production quality language parser, are more heuristic based and they just kind of like, oh, I'll just search for some curly brace and then put some stuff in there. Um, and even what I'm going to show you today has a little bit of heuristics in it that I'm, I would like to figure out how to get rid of. I have a suspicion I can, but I haven't gotten that far yet. Um, the, the, so C and C++ code bases are often quite old and the older the code base, the more desperate is in need of refactoring, but we need automated high quality refactoring. And to get some kind of tool adopted into everybody's workflow, it needs to be easily invoked from your workflow. That means if you're in VI, I should have a way to invoke it. If you're in Emacs, there should be a way to invoke it. If you're in Visual Studio, there should be a way to invoke it. If you're in Eclipse CDT, there should be a way to invoke it. If you're in Qt Creator, there should be a way for you to invoke it. Um, the tool has to be accurate, and it can't ever produce incorrect code, or you just won't use it. You just go back to doing manual things. Um, so here's some examples that I know of that exist. Um, if you know of more, please email me because I always like to hear about other refactoring tools. I am willing to go try them. I currently work develop in Visual Studio because that's the environment most productive for me. But if I had something that was giving me really powerful refactoring, I'd probably switch. Um, there's Visual SysX and Code Rush are, are two add-ons for Visual Studio. I use Visual SysX. It's not bad, but it still has a tendency to uh, change my code and kind of do half the job, and then I have to go do the other half with a manual edit. Um, code Rush is one that supports a lot of refactorings, but when I last evaluated it, maybe I guess it's getting on five years ago now, um, it was just too buggy, and it just slowed everything down. I mean, scrolling the source window got slower, and I'm like, why is my down arrow key suddenly working so slowly? Um, from the CLI, there are several tools that are provided in the Clang distribution. There's Clang Modernize, there's uh, Remove Seaster Calls, which we're going to look at in more detail, and Clang Tidy. It's a refactoring tool, but it's more along the lines of 
we have this rule that says all our I member <coughs> variables have to end in underscore, and this one doesn't do that, so I'll just fix it up for you. This, it's more of those kinds of uh, style-based refactorings. Um, the Eclipse C developer toolkit version has some refactorings. Every person I know that's ever used that says they suck. So um, if you know of other ones, please email me, let me know. So here's an example, the problem we're going to look at today. Um, we've got this source file and the thing that is in here is that some guy with dusty old C habits has been putting useless voids in all the empty argument lists and we think that's stupid and just a complete pointless distraction so we want to get rid of that. And that's the tool we're going to build. So, uh, but it's more than just function signatures, right? I mean, the, here's, uh, you know, all these pointer to functions and pointer to member functions and type defs and static casts and reinterpret casts and C style casts and return values of, fun of functions that return function pointers. All of these places have this little extra void in there that we want to get rid of. So, um, the way we're going to attack this is going to use Clang, the, the tooling library that's in Clang. And uh, I develop on Windows, so I went and downloaded the binary package and nothing's there. No libraries, no headers. It's in the Linux package, it's not in the Windows package. So I had to go and build the whole tree myself. I built it on this machine, which has eight cores. I generated like enough heat to pop some popcorn and it took 90 minutes of 100% CPU and I got a 9 gigabyte build tree. Okay, that is not a really workable situation. We'll see what we're going to do about that. Um, and it's like, seriously? Yeah, that's what you're stuck with if you want to develop a, ref a refactoring tool in the Windows environment for now. The Linux packages have the headers in the libraries, static libraries. So you could get going with a Linux pre-built package, um, but you may not have a Linux distro supported by this package. You might have to build it anyway. Visual Studio, but it does not, it's not a matter of the compiler. In, ter in terms of the package that they've built, it's not a matter of the compiler. It's a matter of the way they're building the package. There's support for it in the build system to make an appropriate package. They just, for whatever reason, told the build system not to. Because uh, I think they had in mind like that Windows was some weird use case that wasn't like all the other platforms, which I think is wrong, but that's why they built it that way. They, they intentionally did this, left it out of the package. Um, there's also, some of the packaging logic is missing some useful tools for a refactoring developer. Um, we're going to look at one of those tools that is missing in the 3.4 distribution. Um, there's also that tool we're going to look at required libedit to be built and the libedit was just <coughs> window dressing. It wasn't a core need of the application. It was just to give you a nice scroll back history of command input. Um, I hacked it on my Windows machine because I don't have libedit to work without libedit and that will be what I'll be showing you later. Um, and the, I don't know about the build. I've got a bug open on that. Um, some of the tools being missing, it's gotten a little better in 3.5, uh, which has not yet been released, but that is what Trunk is. And because uh, I went to go contribute some of what I'd done here as a patch, and I was like, oh, they're moving so fast, they already fixed it. So um, it's getting better, um, and I'm whatever is uh, that I think is missing that would be useful to a refactoring tool developer as a pre-built binary included in the package, I'll be submitting uh, patches back to them to try to get those things included. Uh, so that's basically what we said here. It should be better in 3.5. Um, my goal is that you should just, you, you don't, as a refactoring tool developer, you don't actually care about building Clang. You care about using Clang as a library. So you'd like to be able to just download something that has a library built that you can just link against it, has header files, has documentation, so you figure out everything you need to do, but you don't need to be, you know, a Clang build expert. And that's the goal that I, I think we can get a lot closer to that in 3.5. So um, here's what we want to do. We need to remove this <coughs> void paren stuff. There's an existing uh, refactoring tool 
shipped with Clang, called Remove Seaster Calls. And that thing removes redundant calls to Seaster. So if I have a method that takes a standard string and I pass it a character literal, there will be an intermediate temporary created that is the standard string that holds that character literal and then that's what the function sees, right? But if I have a standard string and I call cstir on it to get a c style string and then I pass it to that function, I'm needlessly taking my standard string, converting it to a c style string just to create a temporary of a standard string holding the c style string that I can then pass to the function. So there's a needless work going on there. What remove cstir calls tries to do is identify functions that receive arguments by standard string, but the actual argument that we passed it was standards, a standard string on which we called cstir, and then it just removed the cstir. Um, so we can use that tool as a starting point. Here's an example of what this tool does. Here's a call to a function that takes a standard string, but we've passed it the cstir result of a standard string. Can you guys see that? No. Sorry. It's just too bright from that. Oh, the doors open out, so that'll work. Guess they'll have to go past the shades. Uh, all right, so that's, can you see it now, or is it, is it blurry? Uh, well, it's cyan, actually, so it should be bright, but anyway. Um, anyway, the, 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 it should be okay as we, is it easier to read this stuff in the box? No, that's harder to read. That's harder, that's harder to read. Yeah. Wow, okay, I screwed up on my color scheme. Um, <laughs> anyway, so we're going to uh, remove that, this tool will remove that call to cstir. And um, so let's take a look at at how this code is put together. Um, the first thing, as if, we, if you opened up that file, the source file for remove cstir calls in the uh, Clang distribution, the first thing of in that's interesting you'll see is there's a couple of command line arguments. Um, LLVM support library gives us a class for handling command line options. Um, the first positional argument in the command line to remove cstir calls is the path to your build directory. And then there's one or more source files. And um, in their implementation of main, there's some startup code that the first thing they do is just call a function to uh, print out a nice stack dump if they got an unhandled signal. Uh, they create a compilation database. And we'll see more about compilation databases. Um, and parsing to the command line options and if we didn't get a command line database when we first tried to get one, we'll try to parse that uh, out of the command line options again. We'll try to load. We'll try to load a command line or a blah, load a compile database from the build path that was specified. And if that didn't work, we're going to throw an error because we really you can't do anything useful with the refactoring <laughs> libraries in Clang unless you can supply it a compilation database, and we'll see why um, in a bit here. And then the very last part is that we're going to instantiate this refactoring tool. And Clang has already uh, a, a, a small class hierarchy of tools. And a refactoring tool is a base Clang tool that knows how to parse source files into an abstract syntax tree, match nodes against that abstract, abstract syntax tree, uh, and then create a list of source file text replacements. And then apply those uh, replacements to the files and save it out. And um, you, can, you build this tool, this refactoring tool, from a compilation database and a list of source files that you're going to refactor. So the, the main thrust of uh, any one of these kinds of Clang-based refactoring tools is that we're going to have a match finder that is the thing that um, connects up our code that handles, that figures out what to, kind of replacements to build, connects that to a syntax tree matcher. And here's, in this particular uh, tool, fix C stir call is the thing that implements that callback on matched AST nodes. 
and um, we connect it to the tool by using it connected to the the tool has a replacement list that it will use and we connect our little uh, code that's going to identify the code to be replaced we connect it to the replacements list there are matchers added to the finder we'll see in a second what the detail of a matcher looks like and then the tool you call tool run and save and that basically just everything up until this point has been just kind of wiring components together and then we say go and it's kind of nice because notice like this saves us from having to figure out like well you know I gotta go open the source file I gotta go down to the point where the source text is located and put in the replacement and then I gotta put the rest of the file out there and what if I have lots of edits to the same file I gotta make sure I do them all in the right order or I might mess up something and the tooling infrastructure just handles all of that for you so all you need to worry about is writing the code that says what am I looking for in the abstract syntax tree and what am I going to do to it? So you stay focused on writing a refactoring and you don't have to worry at all about any kind of file system saving and any of that stuff. So here's uh, this remove Seaster calls has two matchers. Um, the first matcher is this one where we um, look for something that is a, a function that takes a standard string and we're passing it um, a standard string where we've called Seaster on it. Um, let's take a look at these little pieces in here. Um, matchers uh, are built up with this Fluent API that basically gives you a bunch of methods to you know, have a readable source code that says what kind of matching construct you're building. A construct expert all these matchers are, have names that match the class names of the abstract syntax tree. <clears throat> so the, in the abstract syntax tree, there's a C++ class called construct expert that represents expressions of <coughs> constructors. Because what we're looking for is a const constructing a standard string from a call to standard string dot seaster. So we're looking for a, a, a constructor call expression and the constructor call should be um, declared with the same name as the string constructor for standard string. It should have an argument count of two. That is the constructor should have an argument uh, count of two. And the first argument should be a call to standard string cster. We figure that out by using a member call expert because uh, cster is a member function. So invoking that is a member call. And um, we can bind any of these nodes to symbols so that when we're processing the match nodes, we can query them by symbol name to find uh, the appropriate part of the match. There's a... Um, bit of code in the handling of the refactoring in this uh, tool that tries to differentiate between when you say string dot seaster or you have a string by pointer or smart pointer and you say string dash greater seaster and in order to figure that uh, which one of those cases out it needs to have a binding to the member expression um, the member expression um, is the part before the function call arguments in the case of a member function call. Um, and so they, they just bind that up so that they can use it later. Um, and they say that the, the member call that we're matching against has to have the name, has to be declared with the name of the string seaster method. Uh, they also going to want the argument to this member call, so they're binding that up. And um, these uh, call e matchers have an, the, the inner matcher, in, in the first case it's member expert and then method decal. Uh, they match up between the actual call and the call e. Uh, it's, it's the call e that we want to match against. And then the second argument should be the uh, default argument. Um, because uh, if you remember, standard string takes us an optional second argument that I believe is the allocator and we just don't want to deal with allocators we're going to 
assume that that argument is the default. And then finally, attach it to our uh, processing code by take this whole thing, that whole first part was building up a matcher, and then the second argument is our callback code. Um, the second matcher does something very similar, um, but it's for the, L there's some class, string classes that are internal to LLVM, and this uh, refactoring tool is used on the LLVM and client code bases, and so they want to do the same kind of fix up when people use their internal string classes. Um, and in this case, it's a method decal, but it could be one of two, um, two different uh, constructor names. Uh, so would they use any of to combine them up? In general, uh, these matchers, there's this rich fluent API for building up matchers and there's the ability to say uh, an outer node takes an inner list of matchers and all the inner list um, of matchers, if they all match and the outer node matches, then the whole thing matches. It's just a way to combine things up without having to write lots of code to do it. Any of takes a, a list of child matchers and matches if any of the child matchers match, um, which is just saying if it has either of those two names uh, in the method declaration, then the method declaration is matched. Um, and in this case, they don't have that second default argument, so the argument count is only one. And um, these are the uh, method name constants. You know, standard string isn't really standard string, it's just a type def for standard basic string of care and uh, care traits of care and allocator of care. So that's the real name that we have to use when asking is this constructor uh, have a declaration that matches that. Um, that's the, the name of standard string and then the method name is basic string because it's the constructor of basic string that we really are interested in. Uh, it's the same deal for Seaster, that big, long, disgusting name of what standard string really is, and then it's the name of the Seaster method. Yes? Um, so what if you wanted to map, say, wchar string, right? Uh, so w string? Right, so... You would need to just you, duplicate all of this same stuff. And then use a... a and you would use yeah. standard basic string of wkrt... Uh, sorry, repeat the question. The question was, what if you're using W string, which is another type def of standard basic string on W care T instead of a type def on care? And it just means that these names would change. Uh, you would, because the refactoring that we're doing when removing these calls would work identically for W strings as it would for narrow strings. So you would just need to, um, in our, as we did for the Clang, LLVM string classes, you would match on a method name that was any of narrow string constructor or wide string constructor. So the question was, does a tool have, tooling infrastructure have a way of matching any template? And the answer is yes but not when I'm referring to specific names of specific instances of a template. And the only reason that I'm uh, stuck with handling only narrow strings here is because I have referred to the method by its name and I'm referring to the method of a, of a particular instantiation of the template and I'm not, I'm, in other words, I'm not refactoring the template definition, I'm refactoring instances of the template. Is that answer for you? Okay. So, um, we're going to cheat and take our refactoring tool and just stick it down in the, the Clang distribution as the easiest way to get going. And so we we'll do that by copying this remove Seaster calls into a new directory. We'll copy their um, source code and rename their source code to be a file name that's suitable for our tool. So we'll rename Seaster calls CPP to remove void arg CPP. And we will um, edit the, the build script, cmakelist.txt, to change the names again, make them match. Um, and then we'll edit the parent directory, cmakelist.txt, to, to traverse into our new subdirectory that we've added. And then we'll, if the code's exactly the same, it's exactly the same thing, it's just under a new name. 
just test the build to make sure that we got it glued into their, their build uh, correctly. And uh, here, is, here is our little test case, uh, our, our first set of test cases. Our, this is one that we're interested in that has the void argument. This is the one we want to change. Here's a function that has no arguments but didn't have the void. That's related, but we want to leave that one alone. And then here's one that takes an integer argument. We want to leave that one completely alone. So we just kind of put some simple variation in there to try to um, get things going. Now, what's nice about Clang is that uh, you can dump the abstract syntax tree just from the command line. And um, we can do that by passing xclang ast dump dash f syntax only and the name of our source file. It will then parse the file and then dump out whatever the abstract syntax tree that it found in a little kind of pretty printed tree style representation. And this works just fine on Windows, even, you know, so you don't need to run the Microsoft compiler to get anything going on here. This is just pure parsing and then building an AST and then dumping out a representation of the AST. Um, every abstract syntax tree that you're going to process uh, is almost certainly going to start with a translation unit decal. So that's a declaration record that in the Clang um, AST model that represents the entire translation unit, everything in your source file. Um, here's our first uh, function that was interesting, and it was turned into a function decal nested inside the translation unit decal. And over here, we can see that it said, oh yeah, and the function is named foo, and its signature is int with uh, a void argument list. And it also tells us the source location of all of the things that it found uh, in the abstract, uh, source, uh, abstract syntax tree. So every node in the tree is associated with a range of bytes in the source file, which is great, right? Because that's exactly what you need for a refactoring tool. You need to find that stuff in the source file. In this case, it says it's in test CPP, line one, character one, two, line three, character one, which if we look back at our, our file, that I'd actually in my little test file, I didn't have that comment at the top. So it starts right, right at line one, character one. Um, the uh, next function decal, it finds bar and it says int with void parameter list. We'll get to, get to that in a second, why that one also said void. And the uh, third function decal that we had in our file was a function called feasel that has signature of uh, taking an int, returning an int. Uh, so it found both our argument list functions, but it printed them out both with uh, a void argument list signature. Uh, so what's going on there is that when you dump out the abstract syntax tree and it shows you this little summary of each node, it is printing that in a, what it thinks is a canonical form for in terms of just how these abstract syntax trees print out their a summary of what their contents are. So it's not literally text from your source file. It's a representation of the syntax node that was built from the text in your source file. Um, so in Clang, Building these matchers is kind of the essence of how you get at the pieces that you're interested in. There's three kinds of matchers that they have created. You can create your own matchers as well. Um, the first type is a node matcher, which matches to a particular kind of node, like a constructor declaration, a field declaration, a variable declaration, and so on. Then there's narrowing matchers that match on the attributes of node, of a node. And that's, we saw an example of that where we were taking a matcher for all constructor calls. We narrowed it by saying that the constructor calls and declaration name should be the constructor for a standard string. We narrowed it further saying it should be the constructor that takes two arguments. And then further that the second argument should be the default argument. Those are all narrowing uh, clause, uh, narrowing matchers that were added into the node matcher to uh, focus that match down on just the constructor calls we were interested in. 
there are also traversal matchers that allow you to express more complicated matchings based on relationships between nodes. So in, in our example, we saw an example where they used the Kali matcher where they were uh, matching up between the caller and the callee. Um, and you can use that to do parent-child relationships and all kinds of interesting things. So there's a um, matcher reference on uh, the client documentation website. And when I first looked at this table, it, it's a lot longer than I've shown you here. This is just an excerpt of the node matchers. Um, but when I first looked at this table, it was a little confusing to me um, because they're, um, these links don't actually take you to the doxygen for the matcher classes. They take you to the doxygen for the abstract syntax tree nodes that the matcher classes match. So basically, to understand the matcher classes in terms of the documentation on their website, it's this one page. And you have to figure this out. It's, um, the, the center column is the name of the matcher function. The right column is the, the types of the matcher arguments. And uh, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but there's a little dot, dot, dot there on some of these uh, command line arguments. And that means you can have uh, one or more, or zero or more, uh, arguments of that type. And then the matcher match it, generates a type that is matcher parameterized on some node type. And then the key thing that's not obvious is that the types that are returned by the matchers are the input types to other matchers. <coughs> So to figure out what combinations are possible, you kind of has to keep looping back and forth between the left column and figuring out where you can use that on the rightmost column. Uh, once you kind of get that mental map, you, you can kind of see um, it's still not as easy as it should be. Um, I have some ideas about that. Uh, but you can at least, this is how you have to traverse this table in order to build up more complicated matching expressions. Um, each matcher has Doxygen documentation for the nodes that's linked from the uh, matcher reference page. But almost all these matcher functions are really simple expressions and they live in a single header. So you can just go, uh, it doesn't hurt to just go and look at that header and see like, oh, that's what it's doing. It's calling that member function on the node and comparing it to this value and that, that's how that thing is doing narrowing. Um, so I mentioned there was this thing about a compilation database uh, when we were talking about the command line arguments. One of the difficult things of refactoring C++ code is we have to know the entire preprocessor context up to the point that we are refactoring. So that means any symbols you defined on your command line, uh, I have to know the include path that you're going to use to build this file because different preprocessor symbols could be defined depending on whether you've got the debug directory searched first or the release directory searched first. It, lots of interesting and creative things people do with their build to control how symbols get defined. And you have to manage all of that. The way that um, Clang uh, for the refactoring tool infrastructure has decided to support that is to use this thing called a compilation database and it basically contains the full compile command for every source file uh, that you build. And um, it's just a JSON array of objects containing three attributes on each object, the directory containing the source file, the command line used to compile the source file, and the source file name. And CMake can generate these. Yay! But not on Windows. Boo. Really? Not on Windows? Yeah. It doesn't work on Windows. I don't know why. We think it's just missing implementation that they were just too lazy. There's, there's been some discussion on the Clang mailing list okay. where they said, really the right way to do this is to get CMake patched. And I think someone is working on that. Okay. Um, and if they're not, then I eventually will. Because so I develop on Windows. I'm fixing all my own pain, right? You know, that's what I'm doing. But in the, you know, you can get these uh, J JSON files by just typing them in an editor, and we'll, I'll show you one in a second. Um, and 
there, I actually came up with kind of a hacky scripty way to process the Visual Studio build log to get it generated for a large build system. Well, could you just uh, 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 write your own build system to use this uh, uh, build compilation database to do your compilation for you? I don't actually know anybody. Uh, the question was, can you have a build system that uses that compilation database and uses those commands to do your build? I don't think there's, even in places where the compile commands JSON gets built, I don't think that's how it's used. It's only used by Clang to know, it's used by Clang to decouple Clang analysis from your build. Okay. So we, your build system records the commands that it uses to build source files. <coughs> Clang can consult that, but Clang doesn't need to know is your build scons, is your build CMake, is it make files, is it Visual right. Studio, is it Xcode. Um, and so what does this look like? Here's an example of one. Um, and uh, I found that things would go horribly wrong if I did not use slash for the path separator. Uh, I could have done the doubly disgusting thing of doubling up all the backslashes. The problem is it's a JSON string and a backslash is a string quoting character in JSON strings, right? So. If you don't, um, the easier thing was just to make it more legible by changing the backslashes to slashes. Um, and uh, so that's the compilation database. Is it, that's all pretty much clear to all of you guys, I'm sure, right? Why you need that. So let's get on with uh, making our refactoring tool. We're going to, that simple test CPP, we're going to see if we can get some things matching in there. And so here's our, uh, our tool, fix void arg, and we're going to build it just like we built uh, fix cster calls with a reference to the replacement list so we, our tool can add to that list. And here's our simple matcher. We're going to look for function declarations where the parameter count is zero and bind that to a function or to an identifier called fn. And Our uh, refactoring tool, there's some basic stuff that every one of these tools is going to need to do. It has to implement the, or uh, has to implement the match callback um, protocol. So we do that by just deriving from a base class. And it has to remember the replacement list. So we just have a uh, private member variable that we stash things off in our constructor. and. I imagine that this little piece of boilerplate would be the same no matter what kind of refactoring tool you were writing. Um, here's the, the more interesting part. And um, so every one of these refactoring tools has to have an implementation of this virtual method called run and it receives a match result from the nodes that were matched. So there's some tooling infrastructure that's run the uh, parser against the source file, built an abstract syntax tree, taken our specified matchers, matched it against the nodes in the syntax tree, and it found some matches. And so the, by the time it gets down to the code you write, it's like, okay, here's some stuff that matched. You go do whatever you want to do with it. And um, the, uh, I just made a, a local variable here for the bound nodes. Um, the bound nodes are the nodes that match that we bound to uh, some string identifier. In this case, we bound it to fn. And the source manager is the thing that connects your nodes and their source locations to files on disk. So we are asking the bound nodes for a function decal node that was bound to fn because I could bind function decal nodes in many different contexts to different identifiers and I could pass them all to a single callback. So this, in this case, we're just looking for the fn. And um, there's a little function, it's maybe 10 lines long in uh, remove cster calls that given a source manager and a node, an abstract syntax tree node, it gets the starting location of that node and the ending location of that node and gathers up all the text represented by that node and returns it to you as a string. Um, that function isn't particularly interesting. It's in the source code if you want to see it. 
but that's how we get the text associated with our node. And then we're going to do something heuristically. This is the part I'm not particularly happiest about. I think there's a better way to do it using the, the syntax tree directly, but um, this was easy and quick enough to get me going. But I don't like it because it's too, it's a heuristic. It's not really parsing. I'm saying, um, remember this is a function definition. So it's the whole function, uh, including the open, closed curly brace of the function, the whole body of the function. So I just go and look for the first curly brace, then go back to the last uh, right paren, and then I say, okay, that's the part where my function declaration ends. Now, of course, this obviously um, is a heuristic and not, not the greatest, but it gets us going. And then uh, if I found some declaration and it ended in paren void paren, then I'm just going to print out that I, you know, what I matched. And I have a little, another little helper function that I wrote here that given a um, syntax node that is in the tree, just uses source manager to go and find its file name and location and print, you know, return that to me as a string so I can print that out. So if I run it on this little simple file, what I get is it found on line one in test CPP, it found int foo void. Great. So we're finding exactly what we're looking for. But this is not a realistic test file at all, right? So what if happens if we put an includes C standard IO at the top of our file? So put include C standard IO at the top, run our tool again, and it matched a whole bunch of extern C functions that I, well, first of all, I don't want to refactor those because they're not mine. And secondly, uh, um, extern C functions, I'm not sure if, I think it would be okay in C++ to apply this refactoring to any functions declared extern C, but the best, remember, the best quality of a refactoring tool is one that is reliable and does not produce incorrect code. And if we're not sure, then don't, don't go there. Is the, you, know, you can always extend it later after you do some analysis and determine it's okay. I think it would be okay, but we're going to be conservative and say, we'll just ignore all those. The problem comes, you know, it's, it's in standard io.h. The problem comes is if your implementation of the C standard library is also used by a C89 uh, 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 source code and com compilation elsewhere, then you're going to break those because you're going to disable. Well, I certainly don't want to refactor standard IO.h, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the owner of standard IO.h. Um, but the easiest way to just get all of this off our plate is to check for functions that are X turn C. <clears throat> so we can do that because there's a little predicate method on the function node object that says, is this function an X turn C function? And we can just say, if it is, just return. Don't do anything. Don't want to care about those. So that gets us back to identifying our single one. Yes? Is there any way to tell whether that came from an include file or from your source file? The question is, is there any way to tell if this matched node came from an include file or my source file? And the answer is yes, and we'll, we'll get to that uh, in a moment. <clears throat> um, the, the, the answer is the source manager knows the source of everything. Uh, which is why back here when we printed out the location of all these matches, it knew that it came from standard io.h on a particular line. I got that from the source manager. Okay, so what about declarations of functions taking a void argument list? Uh, if we add a declaration to our source file for foo, int foo void, and we run our matcher, it found the definition, but it did not find the declaration. So we need to do something a little bit more in our matching or in our analysis. Um, got the definition, did not get the declaration. So there's another method on function, the function node. Uh, it's actually function decal node. Uh, my local variable is called function. Um, that says whether or not this declaration is a definition or not. So we can use that and we can say if it's a declaration then let's print out that we match the declaration. If it's a definition let's print out that we match the definition. So 
Once we do that, it says, hey, I found one declaration on line three, and the declaration was in foo void. I found a definition on line five, and that also had in foo void. I'm yes? Curious. If you didn't fix the declaration, would the compiler complain later? No. Because the, uh, the question was, if I did not fix the declaration, would the compiler have complained? And the answer is no, because semantically, paren void paren is identical to paren paren, which is why the extra void is just a distracting nuisance. OK, because it, it adds no additional information. It conveys no intention. It is a completely equivalent to paren paren. So we can now, um, now that we've identified the things we're interested in, we can start doing replacing. Uh, because it's just string, string substitution, right? So we'll call, um, uh, we'll just get the substring of our, uh, and this one is the, uh, dec uh, is this, the, this is the declaration. So we'll strip off the void Pren void pren, replace it with pren pren, and then we'll build a replacement. The, a replacement is built from a source manager, the AST node that we're going to uh, supply replacement text for, and the replacement text. <clears throat> so in this case, the node was the declaration, so I just needed to supply um, the replacement text for the declaration. And <clears throat> After you've built that replacement, you just insert it on the replacement <coughs> list that you were constructed with. <coughs> Same thing for the definition. The only wrinkle here is that because it's a definition and not a declaration, we have to make sure that we don't delete, accidentally delete the body of the function. So it's replace some stuff in the middle and then keep the stuff on the ends. Yes? So I'm going to be really picky here. Let's say that you had the line um, int uh, slash star paren void paren star slash um, function name uh, paren void paren. Would that replace the comment? Or does the comment not even make it into this because the AST doesn't even have comments? OK, so the question was that suppose I had this uh, written as int foo open paren open comment void close comment close paren. Comments are not members of the syntax tree, right? right? Because comments are white space. So in that particular case, you'd have to hook in on at like the preprocessor level or something. So By the time you get an abstract syntax tree, the comments have been removed. But when you do replacement, um, you have to be aware of that. But like when I replace the function body, the text, the source file text associated with the node does have the comment in it. The abstract syntax tree says you have a function call or a function definition that has zero arguments. You could notice that the source location of the open paren and the source location of the closed paren had a gap and then probe into that gap by obtaining the text from the source file between those two locations, look for this comment and get rid of it. Well, that's my question then. Would the replace insert? Is it searching the source or is it searching the something else? Is it I'm doing a string replace on the source. Okay, so the the source code. code associated with the node. But when I queried uh, the node for matching purposes, um, that do, the comment didn't enter into the matching. Right, but, but, so if there but it is here, yes. If the comments were there before the signature, you would be replacing the comment and not the signature. Not here because I look for the thing that is in telling me to make the change is I said, did the declaration or the definition end in paren void paren? And in that case, it doesn't. It ends in paren open comment void close comment paren. No, no. Yeah, but if you had, had, had open paren close paren and then had the comment <coughs> yeah. paren void paren. Right. Put, put comment. the comment between, say, between the int. So you have int f void close paren. Right? So say int, comment, <coughs> void, paren, paren, close comment, f, void, paren. You would be replacing the comment on the source line and not the actual code. 
possibly is the way I've written this, but uh, the answer is no, not the way I've written this, because I am stripping off the last six characters of the source text and replacing that with paren paren. So in the, what you just described, it wouldn't be the last six characters. Right. I mean, it sounds like there would be a mi mishandling of that scenario, not quite the mishandling described. Maybe you, I think you would just miss it because of the way you were searching in the text. Yes. So we're remember, we're starting with simple cases. The question was, um, could I present some torturous input to this code that would make it <laughs> do something wrong? And the answer is yes, because we are starting with simple cases and working our way up to more complex cases. But this is a very good point that, uh, you know, there's nothing that says you can't have comments and other white space between tokens. And this algorithm, as I'm showing you, is, is a little bit heuristic because it's doing some string compares. And, you know, for instance, it's looking at paren void paren. It's not um, doing a strict token analysis. So the answer is kind of yes and no. We'll see an example uh, in, in, at the end here um, where you might think, based on what I just said, that if I put any kind of arbitrary white space around the parentheses or the void or whatever, that my code would fail, but it, it in fact does not. Um, and it has to do with, remember I said when we dumped out the AST that it had that canonical way of representing things? It comes back to that. Um, okay, so do the same kind of string replace on that and we run it on our test source file and hooray, the little paren void paren got removed from the declaration of foo and the definition of foo. So we have with a small amount of code, we just wrote something that does a refactoring. And it's automatic, it's reliable, it does not produce incorrect code. It has all the qualities that we like in a refactoring tool. So what do you do from now on? Well, you do the shampoo algorithm. Lather, rinse, repeat. Write matchers for the next thing that you want to match in the syntax tree. Build replacement text for the things that you've just matched. And keep iterating until you've uh, accumulated all the constructs that you want to handle. Um, it was mentioned before that uh, we were matching. Yes, this question. Um, it says on the, the slide where you showed the output, I noticed it's missing all the new lines that were earlier. I just deleted some new lines to get it on the slide. Okay. I will show you a, I will show you a real example of a, we'll run the tool and then we'll look at a diff and I think yeah, any white space right. paranoia will be alleviated at that time. <laughs> I, but it's a fair point. Again, you know, I, just because I run a refactoring tool, I don't want it changing all my indents or anything like that. So this is a, actually this is a good time to digress a little bit. Um, you guys, how many of you guys are familiar with Clang Format? About a third. So Clang Format <coughs> is actually a tool that they created as a consequence of their attempts to create refactoring tools. Because they were making refactoring tools and we deleted some characters from a line. What if at the end of that line somebody had created that nice little kind of column of comments all lined up just right. Now I deleted four characters off the line and damn it, you screwed up my columns. Clang format is designed to make that person happy. Because Clang format can be instructed with all the particular little style rules that you have. And after we refactor code, we can run the Clang format pass on it. And then Clang Format will say, hey, it uh, looks like all these things used to be lined up in a column except for this one, so I'll just fix it for you. And it'll put in some white space. Um, so that is another thing that as a refactoring tool author, you don't have to worry about. You, if someone says, hey, I ran your tool on my thing and it just moved all my white space around. You're like, dude, just figure out a Clang Format configuration that works for your code and, and you know, either run it at yourself on your code after you refactor it or you know, I'll add a feature to run Clang format with your format style after every time I change your code. But it's another thing that the tooling infrastructure does for you that you don't have to worry about. And trust me, the details of elaborate formatting is not what you want to spend your time on. You want to spend your time on improving your code with an automated tool. 
Okay, so lather, rinse, repeat. That's what we're going to do. Um, at some point, as was mentioned earlier, you get matches against files you can't change. And we need a way to, like I actually ran my tool against, uh, or, or I looked for instances of paren void, paren, and boost, and I found one at uh, boost uh, scope exit. Um, <clears throat> but I don't want to refactor boost just because I included it. I just want to refactor my stuff. Um, uh, Visual SysX has something like this where it says, tell me all the directories of things I should never change and I should just assume are stable so I don't keep rebuilding indexes and stuff like that. Um, and I think that's a good, it's a good idea. So the source manager knows the source file of everything that we're editing. So I just made myself a little Boolean predicate that said, go get me the source file associated with some source location. And if that thing was test CPP, then OK, we're good to go. Now again, simplistic logic, because we're doing the simplest thing to get us going. Um, but it's not hard to figure out how to handle this, to handle arbitrary directories and search paths, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's all just details. Um, it has a nice little method on source manager called get file name. You give it a source location and it gives you back the file name. It gives it to you as an LLVM string ref class. You can call stir on that to get a stud string out of that. Um, so <clears throat> it's kind of annoying to have to keep writing a matcher, compiling it, dumping out the output to see if we match nodes. There's a tool that comes with Clang called Clang Query. It is not in the 3.4 package, but it is in the th in 3.5. It will be in the package. I already checked that. And this is the one that was dependent on libedit, and so I had to hack it up a little bit to get it to build on Windows. <clears throat> but they've also fixed that in 3.5, so that'll be fixed. And uh, you just run it with a source file. It looks, it has some other command line options too. And you can, um, it'll get the compile commands JSON from the, the same directory as the source file. I built for my testing, I built my compile commands JSON from my Visual Studio uh, CL command line. So I passed all these command line arguments to Clang that it's like, I don't know what to do with that. You know, all these kinds of things it um, complained about. But they are all just warnings and it's harmless. It did parse my source file and turn it into a source tree. And from there, I can run a match command where you just express arguments to the match command that are the names of those matcher functions that we saw on the AST matcher reference. So I can say uh, match static cast expert. This is a later version of my test for source file that has some static cast stuff in it. And then it said, hey, yeah, I found a, a call to static cast. And uh, it puts a little green arrow at the beginning of the source location that matched and it puts green tildes spanning the, uh, the range of source text that matched my matcher. And in this case, I said match a static cast expression. So that's everything beginning with static cast all the way to the closing paren of the static cast. Note very carefully, it does not include the semicolon. So when I run the matcher and it gives me a range of source locations, if I had lots of white space and comments and all kinds of crazy stuff sprinkled in there, the beginning and ending source locations for the matcher would span that entire range. Um, so we can take a look at Clang matcher or Clang query. I need to do duplicate. There we go. You guys can see that. So I've got, I can start it for you again. I've got my test file. This test file has a lot more stuff in it. So I got things with white space and function pointers and member function pointers, all kinds of crazy, disgusting void stuff. I can query on that. And if I say match static cast expert, those are the matches we got out. If I say match function decal, here's all the function decals that it matched. 
It's 337 because I wrote custom code in my refactoring tool to exclude system includes, but Klein query doesn't know anything about that. Um, I think actually that is a, a very common use case and I may contribute a matcher back to uh, Clang that allows you to say uh, a matcher based on the file name associated with the node so you can just discard uh, all the ones except the ones you're interested in. Um, but remember in C++ your program text that is, goes to the compiler is not just what you see in your file, it's everything that's transitively included all the way down to the bottom. So that's why when I said show me uh, function decals, I got 337. The last few ones here we're all, oops, we're all ones from my source file. Uh, so we got a constructor that matched. Uh, we have uh, a class that matched. So on. All kinds of different things. Yes, question. Can you make, it looks like you're in a shell for uh, clean. I'm in a DOS shell. Oh. Well, it, it's, it's Clang query running in a DOS. Yep, window box. Query now, right? Yes. So can you do this from the shell so you can just correct them all these good things said? Um, um. The answer is no, because the only arguments you can give to client query are the source files. The question was, can I give match directives to client query from the command line? Um, maybe I could do it. Let's see. Maybe I could do it with dash C. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Let's see. Yes, okay. I've just been, I barely got it running because it wasn't building on Windows, so I hadn't explored everything. It's a nice little tool for exploring um, the things that match. And there, there's, it, it does, however, have a weakness, which we'll get to in a second. So is there any other kind of match anybody wants me to try before we go back? We can say uh, var decals. So there's all the variables that are declared. And of course, you know, all of mine are at the end. And then there was just a crap ton from standard includes. Can you do anything with templates? templates? Yes. Um, when, you, when you look at the matcher reference, you see that there, it is very full featured. You can match template declarations. You can match template instantiation. You can match explicit and in template instantiation. You can match template specialization. Uh, any Pretty, they got the bases pretty well covered. And it's not hard to write your own matcher uh, for specific things. And um, any matchers that, uh, I, you know, like this testing against the file name seems to be really useful and really common. And so I'll probably contribute one of those back to the Clang code. OK, so let's go back to this. Oops, got confused. Okay, so um, it's very it's very nice to be just to be able to interactively explore the AST that way. Um, it certainly saves the compile link cycle, which is always good. So. Um, the main place where you're going to find information about matchers is on this AST matchers uh, reference page. And um, if you get interested in C++ refactoring, um, as I was evaluating different refactoring tools, I created a, a ref, what I call a refactoring tool test suite, where it's just a bunch of source files with comments identifying each test case and with an expectation of what should happen. And you find that rename is really interesting if you want to broaden rename to be more than just renaming local variables, but renaming any identifier. Yes? It is, uh, are the uh, preprocessor tokens uh, at all uh, represented? Are, are, is that pointed to any way in the ASD, or is that totally obliterated? So the question was, are uh, is knowledge of preprocessor expansion available to you in when you're looking at the AST? And the answer is yes. Um, it's obviously not as easy as just looking at the syntax tree node, but uh, the syntax tree node is glued back to, um, there's a way to say 
did this text come from something that just appeared in the source file or did it come from a macro expansion? If it came from a macro expansion, what macro did it come from? And um, there's also, I mean, the kinds in C++, the kinds of refactorings that we want to do, there are also refactorings that are specific to macros. Um, like myself, if I find macros whose um, macro arguments begin with double underscore and I'm not the standard library implementer, I want to rename those because the standard reserves all identifiers beginning with double underscore. So me having my macro argument name begin with double underscore or my macro name beginning with double underscore, that's bad. I want to refactor that. But uh, refactoring the macro argument is relatively straightforward. It's a string replaced within a local context. Refactoring the macro name, now I got to make sure I get every use of that macro in all my source files, header and CPP. Um, so in this uh, test suite that I put together, there's like some 500 test cases in there for all kinds of different refactorings. Mostly this is what I use to test against a vendor's implementation of a refactoring tool when they said, ours doesn't have any bugs. And then I found 300 by applying this uh, test suite. Um, so there's, it's full of corner cases, but it's also full of a lot of things that are important, like, you know, why should renaming a namespace be any harder than renaming a variable? The only thing that makes it hard is, is manually finding all the uses of that namespace identifier. But Clang knows all where they all are. Clang can go find it for me and fix them. Um, I've also, over time, accumulated some write-ups of refactorings that I think are useful to C and C++ developers and, and I've written those on my blog. Um, and so there's still room for improvement in this process. I mean, we quick, you quickly saw how it didn't take much code to get a basic refactoring tool going. And I'll, I'll show you my more elaborate implementation where I have uh, you know, static cast and reinterpret cast and pointer to member function and pointer to function and void star arguments passed around or return values, all those kinds of things. I have a lot more of them handled, but uh, it's still room for improvement here with what Clang is giving us because the packaging is not uniform across platforms. I shouldn't have to build Clang myself. That's It'd be different if it was a five minute build, but it's 90 <coughs> minutes of, you know, generating lots of heat into my lap. I, that's not what I want. Um, and we need a build, we did a kind of a cheat where we took our tool and we just kind of dropped it in Clang's tree and leveraged their uh, build recipe to just kind of get our tool going. That's fine for prototyping, but we need examples of a build recipe that will work and build your tool outside of the Clang tree using only the distributed build that uh, Clang makes available. Um, I could not find any documentation on the grammar that is accepted by Clang query. Um, that makes it hard to use. Um, and just even manually navigating that AST matchers page could use some improvement. I thought of like, you know, wouldn't it be nice if just a little JavaScript application that as I just clicked on types, it just kept showing me where I could go from there and kind of construct it up interactively, a little query that I could then go and take the Klein query and try it out. That would be cool. Um, there's enough uh, information about the compatible types there that that shouldn't be difficult. Um, there's so far, um, nobody's written any kind of tutorial for how to take this refactoring tool that you've made and plug it into some kind of IDE. There are, um, example macros that for VI or Vim, I guess more properly, that uh, hook in Clang format. So you get a short key uh, sequence that you can invoke to reformat code from inside VI. But um, no example of saying, uh, hey, I'm just in this source file in, v in Vim and I noticed right here I've got a thing that removes Seaster calls could get rid of. Let me just invoke that right away. There's no example of that kind of IDE integration. And, that, and that's just for Vim, right? Which is just going to be a macro to shell out to a command and then refresh the source file. Um, it's more difficult to glue it into Eclipse or uh, I don't, does Qt Creator have any kind of plug-in ability? Yeah. 
so, you know, and, um, something. There's something. Yeah. Some way that it can be extended. So I think that, that uh, once we start getting some you know, command line tools that work, that's the next step, is to getting it plugged into everybody's workflow. Um, and I think this is an exciting thing to work on. It's useful to the whole community. It's one of these things where we can all make our own lives better, kind of stone soup wise. You know, we each put one little ingredient in the pot, and the next thing, you know, we got a tasty soup. Just here at the conference, I realized Clang Modernize needs a new feature, and that is if your class derives from boost non copyable, we should delete that and replace it with a deletion of the copy constructor and copy assignment, right? We should, do, you know, that's what it means to be non-copyable, so in a C++ 11 term. So we should have an enhancement to Clang Modernize that does that kind of a transformation. I think that would be cool. I, th I think we can all think of little things that are, um, remember refactoring is transforming the structure of existing code while preserving the same behavior. Obviously rename is a behavior preserving transformation as long as your, your new name is not conflicting with any existing name. And as long as you get all the uses of the old name modified. So um, if there's anybody that's interested in collaborating on that, I, I would love to hear from that. Um, so just to recap, all the hard stuff is done for us by Clang. So if you ask a vendor for a feature for refactoring in your IDE or anything, and they're like, eh, C++ is so hard to parse, you just say, go get Clang and stop whining about that. Just get on with it. <coughs> um, we got started by copying an existing tool. Um, it's important to build a set of source test files that you feed to your tool to, to keep double checking yourself along the way, kind of. Uh, test-driven development with the source file being an acceptance test for what your refactoring tool is supposed to do. Um, start with simple matches against the AST. Build appropriate replacements. Incrementally extend and refine your matching to get it handling more things. Use client query to go and prototype matchers. And uh, you know, if we all chip in a little bit and start uh, building some tools, I think we can get things really get moving forward. Um, Let's take a look at my final, well, not final because I'm still working on it, but I can show you where my little remove void star got, or remove void has gotten to. So here's my final guy. That's way too small for you guys to see, sorry. Let's fix that. Get rid of this. Um, can read that. So I'm matching function decals where the parameter count is zero. I'm matching name decals because I need to match uh, variables and other names that can be so you'll named decal ends up being needed to handle type def. Uh, I'm matching fields, variable declarations. I'm looking for C style cast expressions, static cast expressions, reinterpret cast expressions, uh, const cast expressions. Uh, I added explicit cast in there, um, but I think it might be unnecessary for given all the other ones that I have in there. My little test file has grown. Um, I've got functions, functions with some white space thrown in, func function declarations, function definitions, a class where the constructor and destructor and member functions had void in the argument list, um, pointers to functions as class members, pointer to member functions as class members, pointer to functions as just uh, <coughs> declarations, uh, pointer to functions that are declared and, and defined with an initializer, I want to make sure that I don't get rid of that initializer. I don't want to take correct code and turn it into incorrect code. Uh, type defs, type defs with strange white space shoved in there. Um, global um, uh, declarations of pointer to member, uh, declaration with an initializer, a type def of pointer to member, um, functions with local variables that have 
a pointer to function, uh, member functions with local variables that are pointer to member function, and on and on and on, right? Just think, I just, you know, keep adding more crazy, disgusting stuff into this file as I think of it. Yes, question. Going back to the, the previous slide, or the previous file, uh, the actual code, can you remind me again what, what the bind? So when I ma uh, I'm using the same callback for all the matches. And when I match a node, I bind it to a symbol so that I can say, go get me the function decal <laughs> node that was bound to FN. So, so the FN is just a thing you invented to... It's just a name. Yeah, all those strings in the bind arguments are all just names that I use. And the, the back side of it is... Let's get up here. The back side of it is that I say, go find me the function decal that is bound to FN. So this is the only other place where FN is used. Okay. And you know, you might think like, yeah, but you're only binding to one function decal, so why even give it a name? But I could be interested in multiple flavors of function declarations. I bind them to all the different symbols. And then when I'm inside here, I can, I can fetch them all and, and be able to distinguish between each one. Um, and as you can see, I have this, you know, modifiable file thing that I'm using. And then I basically, once I identify which case I'm handling, I just delegate to a member function to do the real work. The member function is, is pretty similar to what we saw before. We said we get the text. Is it a declaration? If it ends with void argument, then go ahead and build a replacement. And this uh, ends with void argument is where... I handled white space. That's how I got the crazy white space to work. So we can see this run. So here I am with my test file with all that crazy stuff in it. I have it under version control and we can see that it's not modified. I can run ran my test, check the status. It says I've modified the file. So we can go over here to look at a diff and I need, probably need to make these fonts bigger. Uh, where do they put it? Options, file viewer, where's fonts? Oh, I see, thank you. Pair programming, yay. Okay, so now it's bigger. Let's see if we can get a little more on there. So you can see it took all the voids out of these declarations. I lost some white space. Yeah, that could be considered a bug or not, but at least I haven't made the code incorrect. Um, took the void out of these definitions. Took it out of all these member declarations. Took it out of the pointer to function and the pointer to member function. Took it out of these uh, variables that I, are pointer to function or uh, whether they're initialized or not and I preserve the initializer. Um, took it out of this type def and this type def. Um, these pointer to member functions, there also got fixed up. This type def of a pointer to a member function also got fixed up. These local variables inside a member function. There's only one in here that I am not yet handling properly and that is this one. Thank you. And that's pretty much it. There's there any questions on any of this stuff? Can you, hopefully you can see that it's not as hard as you might have been thinking. Um, and you may have uh, now incentive to go fix a problem that's been nagging you in your code base, but you didn't want to do it because you'd have to manually edit thousands of files. Yes? So I suppose nothing stops you from running plain to refactor, but still using a different compiler. Yes. The question was, nothing here is stopping you from using Clang to refactor, even if Clang is not the compiler you use to build your code. And that is totally correct. Uh, there is a uh, 
Visual Studio bolt-on that somebody created that lets you run like Clang format, um, but you're not using Clang as the compiler. Yes? Um, I think what just Richard mentioned is that there is in the tool extra directory a tool template where you could get started with. Ah, so the observation was that there's a template for, uh, for a starting point on a tool in the tools extra directory in the Clang distribution. Um, the problem is if you get the built pre-built package, you don't get that template. It's only in the source tree. But yes, it is there. Um, I found it was better to start with remove cstir calls because it already was doing something. And I could just swap out the behavior. And it was obvious to me where to swap things out. But um, it's a good point. I would like to see uh, some kind of um, you know, project wizard or something where you say, you know, what's the name of my project and what's the name of the source file? And it uses a template to generate out a, a starting point for you with some to-do comments saying, you do this here and then do this over there. Um, I think with an out-of-build tree build recipe, that would be immensely useful in getting people going even faster than it is now. Any other? Yes, we'll go you and then you. So the question was, can you use this technique to do code completion? And the answer is, there is special support in Clang to supply code completion. And I believe some people have glued that into Vim uh, in the, as an example, um, that you can use Clang to do code completion. Um, code completion is a different thing from refactoring, because in code completion, I'm creating code. Uh, but there, is, there are facilities to do code completion in Clang and assist with that, because Clang has all the knowledge of all the you know, if I have an object and I type dash greater, Clang knows all the methods on that object that could be called. So it can, it can supply me with a list. Um, and they're, they're, that is a, a use case they're very much aware of, and they've built specific tooling to support that. Yes? Yeah, does Clang support some kind of um, plugins? So could I write my reflecting tool as a little DLL or di a dynamic library, which I load into Clang and then run it? So for, I, I could imagine before. Yes. That kind of database, so if I have a big project in my company and then I want to create that, to, to build database with all those comments we don't use CMake yet, unfortunately. And I would like, since we are using Clang already through Xcode, I would like to just put in a plugin and instead of compiling the code, I refactor the code kind of. Okay, so the question was Does Clang have some sort of plugin API that I can use to instrument my build and capture all the compile commands, for instance, in order to build this compilation yeah. database? And the answer is yes. There are, um, is a well-defined plug-in mechanism for Clang where you can plug in on the front end. You can also, because the whole compiler is available as a library, you can build your own front end that does custom processing and then sends it off to Clang. Um, so there, there are a lot of options. It, it is a, a rich environment for where you can plug in in many different spots. I like this, uh, for a refactoring tool, I like this approach because I don't need to worry about how to launch the compiler or what the build command is. All those <laughs> things are all just kind of taken care of for me. I can just focus on writing the code that says, find this, replace it with that. But it, it, it is very extensible. You can plug in, in in many different ways. Yes? So the find all the matches, replace it seems like it would work really good for lots of things. But like my favorite refactoring Method. It doesn't okay. really match that model. Like, is there a different model, or what are your thoughts on how to do it? So it, it does match that model, and here's how it would. In extract method, you have a source location representing your starting point and a source location representing, representing the ending point. Mm -hmm. Using, so we had a node and queried for the source location. You can make the inverse query. Given a source location, what syntax node matches that? And walk the tree backwards and forwards to adjacent nodes. And you would have, in the case of extract method, there's a little bit of flow analysis you have to do to identify what things are coming in that need to be turned into parameters to the extracted method. And how are things coming out? Generally, the, the Visual Assist X, for instance, has an extract method. And it's pretty good as long as nothing's coming out. It gets very confused on things that come out of the block that I'm extracting. Um, so you can do that analysis, and then you could apply that refactoring, fix up the flow to make sure everything was still correct, 
and then you'd be good. It, it gets even more wrinkly, right, because I could be inside a global function and I'm extracting, in which case that has to be extracted to a function. If I'm in a const method and I extract, the new method has to be const. If I'm in a regular method and I extract, then it can be extracted regularly. But if I extract the new method, should the new method be public, private, or protected? There are many choices and there's no one right answer to a lot of these things. Um, but just getting started of having a reliable extract method would be a big win. Um, and I hear via Chandler's talks that are recorded, so I'm not putting words in his mouth, they have lots of internal refactoring tools at Google. Um, they, I wish they would share them, but if they won't, then we're going to have to make them. Oh, uh, just, just look at GitHub. Uh, find a bunch. There, I found some stashed away uh, in some, when I said I was going to give this talk, some, some people emailed me and said, here's another example I've got. And I'm like, okay, it's kind of hidden away in a random GitHub repo. And it wasn't even discoverable by browsing, so I wasn't sure if I could share that or not. <laughs> but I think what we need to do as a community, or what I'd like us to do as a community, is to start getting a central repository. Maybe Boost Incubator would be a good place to kind of, it's not really a library though. But anyway, we, if, I think we can move forward at a much faster rate if we all contribute in and then you know, we all, you know, so I write one little thing and that we all get to use it and somebody else wrote a little thing and 10 people write 10 little things and I got 10 little things I can use. I think that that is really the answer. Any other questions? I got five minutes, so we got time. Uh, I have one remark or a comment. Um, I did a similar talk at Meeting C++ two years ago and if you look at Google for Clang, Lip, Tooling, and Qt Creator, you will find um, my German blog entry from 2012, um, where I read a little bit about how to get um, a refactoring tool built with Clang, uh, running in Qt Creator, compiling with QMake. Um, it's two years old, I don't know if it's still So, the, the, you built the tool with QMake? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll go check it out because I'm... Yeah, I, had, I had the go that maybe I wanted to use Qt with it and... Everyone. Yeah, now the, all the... Th we used a bunch of stuff from Clang and we kind of stole their little build environment. But fundamentally you're just using headers and libraries and you could use that from any build environment. It's not specific to CMake. It's just that that's what they were using so it was the easiest way to, to just hijack something for our own purposes. Um, that is one of the very nice things about this is that it is a library that is designed to be used in this way so it is documented the doxygen information is is good uh, on all the a abstract syntax tree nodes um, there's also documentation on how to hook into the preprocessor at that level if you need to do that um, i haven't done that yet it's scarier but um, maybe for next year well i'll show you how to do that um, so I, for me, I was just like, hey, Chandler, I watched that talk. It seemed like it was easy. Let's just go try it and see how easy it was. And I got a guy in my team that does the void thing all the time. So um, I was like, let's just try this, you know. And then we can see if we can just fix all the code at once. And then if there's no existing instances of this old bad habit, you're less likely to have new people putting more instances in, right? Because you put, tend to put code, you tend to add code in the same flavor and style as the code that's there. Yes? The ultimate thing to do is to hook the refactor tool to your source code um, control check-in. And every time you check in a uh, file, it runs the refactor tool and it really says, hey, you know, you put a void thing, you, you put a C, C uh, style cast, uh, you did something dumb, you know, don't do that. So the comment was, uh, you could hook these uh, refactoring tools to your commit mechanism to prevent new instances of this bad style from creeping in. And you should read the Clang developers mailing list because people contribute patches and like, hey yeah this all looks great just run it through Clang format before you submit. And it just kind of vaporizes all their white space differences. Um, this could be you know a similar kind of thing. Uh, I think maybe on occasion I might have even seen people say uh, great patch, just run it through Clang Modernize first. Because you're doing some things kind of the old way. Um, 
any other questions, comments? Okay, uh, we have a little bit of time and I have a little bit of swag left. Yes. Can you generate code? Well, the question was, can you generate code? So, generating code is inserting nodes into the AST. You can do that. Of course, um, an example would be if, you're, if your refactoring was extract method, I have to touch up the header at a minimum. I may have to touch up a CPP file and um, I certainly again need to find some way of inserting text, you know, inserting nodes into the AST and, uh, and supply the associated source text. Um, it's a more advanced operation, but yes, that, that is all possible. In other words, the syntax tree that you get back is modifiable, but it is also dangerous because you can take a syntactically correct syntax tree and then modify it to be nonsense, right? So. Yes, uh, Clang Modernize uh, does exactly that. Whatever it is. <laughs> um, I mean, I could bring it up after I got the whole tree on this laptop. I could show you, but um, there are, there are examples of you know it's just more complicated than I want to go on. So I have a uh, couple CDs of graphic 3D graphics demos and a couple CDs of electronic music. Um, I'm just going to let you come up and grab one if you're interested. And that's basically it. Thanks very much for your time.